sisters to our brothers and sisters. Hotep, I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents, the H3O Art of Life show. The title of this show is Family Matters. And I have, I have the most interesting guest today because actually I have an attorney, Attorney Lawrence E. Kennan, who is a very, very dear, very old friend of mine. And we talk a lot about a lot of things, and he is so knowledgeable in so many areas that I, I'm inclined to want to talk legal matters. But he has such a, an outstanding and unusual family, in, at least in this day and age, that I thought I might want to talk about his family and talk about our need to, to tighten up or, you know, kind of solidify our families not just because these are pressing economic times, but because that's the way we should live mm -hmm. as people. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Very happy to be here. I'm very happy to have you here. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to go back to uh, the, as early as you care to go in your family. Let's talk about your parents and the children that they, that they gave birth to and raised mm -hmm. and, and see if we can't distill some wisdom from the way mm. they went about getting uh, the, f the family that we're talking about today in place? Well, I'm sure my family was, were, was birthed through the usual means. Okay. And after that point, uh, we have... Where? In the city? Yeah, all we of have you? seven. We're all in the city. We were born here. Okay. My parents were from Mississippi and came here before we were born. Okay. which incidentally is the way back in the day, the only distinction between a person born in the South and here was that the parents got here first. Okay. So I was born on the South Side mm -hmm. in St. Luke Hospital, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, and I lived at 4453 South Vincennes, mm -hmm. which was just across the street from uh, Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church, mm -hmm. which is where my people went and of course where I was introduced to the church. But I left there at about four years old, four or five years old, and came to the Old West Side, mm -hmm. which was in the Damon, Roosevelt, Taylor Street area. Mm -hmm. And we lived on Polk Street at, uh, at uh, Damon and Polk. Across on the east side of Damon, the west side of which now houses the Veterans Administration, the mm -hmm. large Veterans Administration mm -hmm. complex there. It was a different world in those times. There were homes over there at that time. And we lived on Polk Street at the edge of the black community. On the north side of Polk was whites, and on the south side was blacks. And we had come down from Roosevelt Road going north and had reached as far as um, Polk Street. The neighbor was, neighborhood was mixed with Italians, and Italians don't flee like others flee. So they stay and hold their grounds, and uh, so nothing happens. Excuse me. You have occasional fights, but everyone does, apparently. Uh, we didn't have as many as today they're having all in the black community. But my, fa my father was a uh, steel, worked at a steel factory a steel warehouse where he was a foreman and then became the superintendent. So we worked on a business kind of schedule in our home. And we had routines for everything and lists for everything. And for instance, early on, we received phone calls at home from Mr. Kennan. So we knew that we had to write down the name, address, and phone number or whatever else pertinent information was as youngsters. And we uh, had places to do our homework. There were seven of us, so we all, six at the time, 
We all interacted very closely. But we were a very loving family, and everything was positive. We never got direct orders in the first place, which I'm just remembering. Anything that was requested of us, it was a please. Would you, Larry, Lawrence, would you please do this? Would you please do that? And so we, of course, it was not really a question, but it was in that form. So you never felt pressured or stressed. My father was a strong, silent type, very, very brilliant, with a photogenic mind. And he um, never lost his cool. And if he had to give you a spanking or a whipping, you knew very well because he believed in notice. Legally, I at least discovered that that's what it means. But he believed in letting you know. So you had the parameters within which you would operate. For instance, he'd say, well, Lawrence, you've got to come in. And they call me Lawrence in the family. If you've got to, uh, you've got to be in at 1030. If you don't come in at 1030, you're going to get a whipping. So all of us understood that was a rule. And I would come in and my fellow classmates and friends out there would say, oh, Lawrence, you're a sissy. You got to come in early and they could stay out as long as they wanted to. So that was a horrible thing to say to a youngster when he's 10, 11 years old or 12 or 14. So finally one day I said, well, you know, I got to show these guys I'm as good as they are. I can come in and stay out after 1030. I knew, though, however, that that meant a whipping. So I stayed out till near 11 o'clock and I came in and my dad was at the door and he says, well, Lawrence, you know what time it is. And there's a thing that I think the young people don't know today. In those days, there were clocks in all of the store windows. So you could always check out where, what time it was. So you didn't have an excuse about not knowing what time it was. And we didn't have watches. They didn't have wristwatches in those days. And I'm talking about the early 40s, the late 30s and the early 40s. Well, they had them, but we didn't own them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You didn't even see them. Uh, they, they didn't have these Timexes, the cheaper mm -hmm. ones. They mm -hmm. had the good ones. So he'd say, you know what time it is? Yes, sir. And do you know what the rule is? Yes, what's the rule? I'm supposed to get a whipping. Okay, go get the strap. And we had razor straps in those days and belts and so he'd turn me over and give me that whipping. And all the kids were there, and they'd watch it. Ooh, you know, you're late. So they'd watch it. And we got, I got my whipping. I knew it was justified. I didn't have any problem with it. And I proved to the guys outside that I could stay out. But it was worth the whipping to me. Now, the good point in that was that there has never been a time when we broke a rule that was supposed to have a, a whipping or a spanking as a punishment, there was never one time that we failed to get it. It was absolute. So the lesson I learned was that there is a responsibility for being irresponsible, and you must get, uh, be able to suffer the punishment if you're going to do something that you know is wrong. Some people today, of course, say that you're not supposed to spank your child. He'll hate you and everything. I think my father was the greatest person Or they'll the arrest you. Today, they'll arrest you mm -hmm. uh, for that reason, mm -hmm. that they say that your children will hurt you and you're hurting them. And I was only whipped on my butt unless I got crazy and jumped or ran or something. Mm -hmm. And if you ran, of course, you got more. Mm -hmm. So you stay there and take it like a man. And... Uh, the other lesson there was notice. You have to have notice about what your parameters are or what it is that you can do and what you can't do. Today, very often, people don't know what they can do because the people, their parents, don't sit down and say, you can do this and you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And I will accept this, I won't accept that. So we had no thought that we could make a plea and get out of it. In the first place, if he ever let one off, He's got six more there he's got to explain to. Mm -hmm. So you knew you had to fulfill that obligation to get a whipping. And each of the ones knew when they did it, they would get their whipping. And we'd all, it was in the presence of us all, always. Mm -hmm. So we would know. And that was the early lessons that I got. How many boys, how many girls? Five boys and two girls. Five boys. And who were who are the older children? The older ones were my sister, Ruth who uh, my dear beloved sister who just passed on the 11th of November mm -hmm. and who was the boss. Then there was uh, my older brother Addison, 
myself, then Herbert, um, and then there was James, Bernadine, and Howard. Mm -hmm. Now James died at 19, mm -hmm. back in 52. Mm -hmm. So there's that reduced the number of boys. Mm -hmm. And then Howard wasn't born until about 53 or so. Mm -hmm. So we had that period where there was really only five or six of us for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And then Howard came along as mm -hmm. a youngster. Mm -hmm. And where did you go to school? I'm on the west side. I went to Gladstone Elementary School, mm -hmm. which was a fine, fine school. And it was... Um, the area, the overall area for the school was mostly white mm -hmm. because the people on Gladstone went down to Polk Street mm -hmm. and then on up to 18th Street on the other end. So the mixture there was really primarily Italian, um, Irish, Mexican, Blacks, Polish, mm -hmm. and some Germans. Mm -hmm. So one of my best friends was Raymond Jarkstorf, who was Polish and German. Mm -hmm. And uh, then another one was Lupe Medina, who was Mexican. So we had the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And our principal was Mrs. Annan, the same name as the head, former head of the uh, United Nations, mm -hmm. who was a white woman with silver hair, very sophisticated and uh, high class, mm -hmm. wore black with pearls, mm -hmm. but she was like, I suppose, we figure she was probably rich. Mm -hmm. She was a social worker at heart, so she really cared for the children, did everything that she could with us, and we didn't have any discrimination in the school. In high school? In high school, I went to Crane, mm -hmm. uh, started out the first semester at um, Cree Gear, mm -hmm. and then because Crane was a kind of what they would call the day uh, uh, the school that you get people from different Commuter city. type school where people come from all over? Uh, yeah. Okay. Magnet is the word I wanted okay. to use though. So you just didn't get in there. You usually had to get, either you had to get some grades or some tests oh, and I if see. it was already okay. loaded you couldn't get in until the next semester. Okay. And in Crane, uh, well in grammar school there was about five or six kids who were black in my class. Mm -hmm. And the classes were usually around 40 children. Mm -hmm. Yet we were orderly, mannerly, and we knew that our parents expected us to be. So you didn't mess around or, you know, mm -hmm. confuse the school. In Crane, <clears throat> we had a large, very large, for some reason, that was an extra large class. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the class of 47. Mm -hmm. We, in my class, there were 400 people and there were five blacks. This was an all-male school at that time. Mm. So I never had another black in my class. Mm. My older brother, Addison, was very bright, uh, who's now with one of the Mensa things. Mm -hmm. And um, he always guided me to get the strongest, hardest classes, because that's the way you get to be smart. Mm -hmm. So when my buddies would be out playing and messing around, I'd be at home doing homework. So I did get a kind of reputation of a person who did homework. Mm -hmm. And um, we went on through high school. The, um, the other guys, all of whom except one now have deceased, mm -hmm. uh, we'd see them. I saw another one in my homeroom, but otherwise. But the saving grace for that was we were sports oriented. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oriented. So I ran track and cross country, and uh, the other guy who was the top guy, the guy, his name was uh, Percy McLean, Ronald McLean. I love your memory. Mm. Well, <laughs> you can remember people from grammar school. I okay. can't remember anybody yesterday. But <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> <clears throat> but he was in the top ten of the class. Mm -hmm. In those early, in the day as they call it, it was a, um, a um, position of honor to be intelligent, to be in the top ten. Mm -hmm. You were like a hero. Mm -hmm. Today, of course, you're the low man on the totem pole if you're the top man in the class. The, the, in those days, those guys who did not get the good grades, you know, we kind of looked down on them a little bit. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, today I know, and I guess we all are aware, that if you're a straight-A student, you're going to get your butt whipped on the way home. Mm -hmm. And it's happening everywhere in the black community. Mm -hmm. Because your better thing now is to be a good dancer and to uh, have more girlfriends and, you know, do a little um, rapping and a little pot and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm making that generalization because in my experience, that is what the, um, what I see, and in all of the polls and tests and so forth, is well, what you, comes Well, you have spent some years as a criminal lawyer, so you probably encountered some of the people whose behavior fit that model in yeah. those situations. Yeah. Well, now, let's get you out of college so we can get you in law school, because okay. i got to get back to your family. Oh, okay, I went to DePaul. Uh, uh, well, I went to junior college okay. and uh, went to both junior colleges. Which was both, because you know, there's more than both now, so how right. many are there? Right, it was Herzl and Wilson. Okay, Herzl, Herzl became? The, Her, Herzl became Kennedy, no, uh, uh, Olive Harvey, right? I don't think so. It became, what did Herzl become? Didn't it come to the south side and become the, the south campus of the junior college? No. No, no okay. No, no. It's, no, no. It was a west, Wilson, it stayed west side. Yeah, Wilson, Wilson came, was the, okay. uh, yeah, Wilson All became right. this uh, teacher's college. Okay. And Herzl became Olive Harvey, yes. All right, mm -hmm. you say so. I have to agree because I don't know that. Yeah. Okay. And, um, so you then went to I junior went. college and got an AA? No, I went on to, I guess probably I did. Uh, but I was on the way to DePaul. Okay. So I just used that as my first two years. I never thought of that as an okay. end. Okay. That was a means. And I went to the last years in DePaul, but I also went, got my law degree. I started the law school because they had a program where you could do your last year in DePaul and your first year mm -hmm. in, in um, law school. Mm -hmm. So it would be kind of melded into it. Mm -hmm. So I did that and came out of uh, DePaul. Mm -hmm. And I came out in 53. And when did you start actually practicing? Well, I flunked the bar the first time. Really? In those days, most of the blacks flunked the bar the first time. Mm -hmm. Those who were working with you would be usually second and third time. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not because there was an honest bar, mm -hmm. but it was because blacks were held down. So you'd only have five or six black lawyers coming out mm -hmm. a year at most. Um, so I flunked it the first time, and there was a draft in those years. Mm -hmm. So I was drafted and went to the Army. Mm -hmm. And then I came back and took the uh, bar again and passed and began in 56. Okay. So I've been practicing 52 years. And still practicing. Still practicing. With no intent to retire. With some thoughts. With some thoughts, right. but no real plan. <laughs> <laughs> you get to be old because <clears throat> actually I'm 79 years old. Oh, really? So uh, my folks have been telling me I shouldn't be 80 and still practicing. Some people don't think that I'm that old. I don't mm -hmm. feel that old or okay. think that old, I suppose. And I started out with um, fellows from my own law school, a W. Albert Washington, who was a true genius. I remember him. Okay, right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles Durham, mm -hmm. who I became a judge. Him. And uh, then Clarence Bryant came along. I remember and him. And E.A. Hunter, Jr. Mm -hmm. So the, I went into the state's attorney's office a year after I was out. So in 57, I went in the state's attorney's office and came, uh, worked at night with these fellows, my two f former law, par uh, former schoolmates, which were Washington and Durham. Mm -hmm. So we started out together. And by the time I got out of, uh, in 61, by that time, Clarence Bryant first came with us, and then E.A. Hunter, Jr. Mm -hmm. came. Clarence was out of Ken, and Hunter was out of Howard. Mm -hmm. And Hunter was from uh, Mississippi, as was uh, Washington, mm -hmm. different parts, but from Mississippi. And in fact, I was the only one, really, who was born in Chicago. Mm -hmm. In those days, it was rare to see a Chicagoan who was a professional. 
So when you would say you were from Chicago, they say, "Yeah, right." Out of from where, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, then were you among the first black law firms to or? Mm -hmm. Well, the five of us, that five of us, we were in those days. You had most of the men were um, associates, mm -hmm. and so they each had their own phone and their own. They they shared rent. Mm -hmm. but they kept their own money and their own clients. Mm -hmm. Well, we decided we wanted to be a partnership. Mm -hmm. And so we formed a partnership in 62, right mm -hmm. after I got out of uh, the state's attorney's office. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we tossed all the money into a pot. Mm -hmm. It was our money and uh, we all shared our clients. And I did the criminal defense because I'd been in the state's attorney's office. And the others did the various civil work mm -hmm. at that time. And there were five of us. Well, there hadn't been five young guys starting out as law as partners mm -hmm. uh, before that time. Mm -hmm. Now there was other partnerships. Um, the names will have to come to me. Uh, that were working together, and then Morming and Layton, which was Morming, and uh, before Layton, uh, and they had a group. And now, they part of them were partners. But we were the first five partners, young five partners, mm -hmm. to start a firm. And we had to make a pact that in order to do this, we were going to uh, refrain from taking a judgeship. Mm -hmm. Now, you didn't just take a judgeship. You mm -hmm. got a judgeship if you were offered and people were happy or trying to get one. Mm -hmm. There's a misconception in the black community that the best lawyer is a judge. Mm -hmm. And so people's parents tell them you're going to be a judge and all this. Mm -hmm. They don't mention the fact that you want to be a great lawyer. Mm -hmm. They're saying you're aspiring to be a judge. Mm -hmm. Well, you have great judges and you have great lawyers. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> in the black community, based on the early days when the partnerships were, there weren't enough lawyers around to have partners in the mm -hmm. first place who were mm -hmm. black. <clears throat> so if you had your own firm, quote, your own office, mm -hmm. you were the chief of your office, you were big time because you ran an office. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the years went on and you began to get more lawyers after 72, after 71, mm -hmm. uh, people still would get into that single office. Mm -hmm. And you'd have these individual lawyers. And we didn't have even two or three lawyers together for the most part. Mm -hmm. But you had a few who were two or three two together or three together as associates. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem there was that the best lawyer is a person who can, can stretch out and represent everyone. The best example of that was that when I was 34, I was in 24th Ward and Ben Lewis was our uh, alderman. alderman. At that point, I was the only black lawyer around, and I was involved in all of the community organizations and the Lawndale Businessmen's Association. I gave the commencement speeches for the churches and other groups that were giving, having graduations. And I had my own youth council, which I'd like to mention. So <clears throat> uh, Ben Lewis called me and said, look, uh, come in and talk. I want to talk to you. He said, I have an opportunity to make you a judge. Well, going back, since most youngsters came through with the idea that you ought to be a judge, that was the great goal to be uh, at the end of your career or to aspire to. He had his fellows, his henchmen around, uh, or polit other polit fellow politicians. So when he told me he was going to let me be a judge, and they said it like, oh, this is a great delivery I'm giving to you. I said, you know, I really appreciate it, but... I don't want to be a judge. And they, their mouths dropped open. They said, excuse me? I said, I don't want to be a judge. So one of the guys said, uh, who was there, with the guy with the pinky finger said, you know, either you didn't understand the question or you're a goddamn fool. So I said, well, let me explain why. I told him that I wanted to have a large law firm. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be able to do like the white folks do. Mm -hmm. He said, what do you mean? I says, well, they have large law firms, and they represent the President of the United States, advice to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. but they represent General Motors, General Electric, Standard Oil. Mm -hmm. And you know, well, the concept for blacks 
had not been that a black person would be talking about representing the major companies in the country. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, you know, you're not going to be representing them. I said, well, we're going to see. So uh, sure enough, later on, I got, uh, when Harold Washington came in, I had known Harold Washington from the early days, as you know. Mm -hmm. And Harold was a part of the group with Gus Savage and Bennett Johnson and uh, Al Howell. Janney, Bernetta Howell. And Lucy Jean Lewis. That's right. So mm -hmm. we all were together. But the guys were separate from the women. We'd have our nights that we really talked about. And so did the women come from time to time. We talked about politics. We talked about uh, philosophy. Some of them were communist oriented. And we discussed those different kinds of things. And they were just magnificent conversations. So I got to know Harold back then. And so when Harold became a candidate for uh, alderman, I was uh, part of that group too. And uh, I was one of the uh, chairman of his lawyer's committee while he was running. Uh, after he got into the office, and he always, already knew I didn't want to be a judge. So he said, well, Larry, I got to do something for you. And I said, well, you know, all I want to do is work and help out because that group, our major group was progressives. We were independent progressives. We were anti-daily, so we were never a part of the machine. And except Harold was a part of the organization, but he was also a part of us. So uh, he made me the uh, chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals for the city of Chicago. But the point was, after he was in, people knew I was head of his uh, committee. First thing that happened is a white fellow comes in and puts $10,000 on our desk and says, look, we, want, uh, we have a corporation we want you to represent us. He says, now, I'm not trying to get any extra clout. You know, we just know you got some good black lawyers and so forth. And so he, that's how we started out. Mm -hmm. Then we got to have clients like the uh, insurance companies and the uh, housing, Chicago housing, things like that. So our firm, oh, let me, our firm then developed, but before, just before that time, of those five of us who started out, W. Albert Washington died in 1977, leaving only four of us. And then uh, Charles Durham went on the bench. Then uh, he was was that after you remember you promised that you wouldn't take a judgeship in order to have the partnership. Charles so Durham broke our pact. He broke the he pact. He broke the pact. Okay. Let me say that def differently. He went he went on the bench first, right, and then uh, uh, Washington died in a okay. short period of time okay. in between. But he did break the pact. Okay. So then um, Clarence Bryant went on the bench. And then Hunter died, the okay. same kind of pattern, okay. leaving only myself. Okay. So then I reached out to uh, Ronald Samuels, mm -hmm. and uh, we got together, and we formed a partnership, and we had 28 lawyers in our partnership. Mm -hmm. So it was the largest in the country mm -hmm. of all blacks. Now, there were others who had that many, but they were integrated. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then to skip, he and I broke up in 1988, uh, but he, we were together in doing this large number of, of people, and Harold died, and we continued to have large uh, uh, clients, but we broke up, and I went with uh, Jones, Ware and Grenard, which was another black law firm, but it was an integrated firm, and Mark Jones, who was a judge, who became a judge, and in fact, he had been a judge and had retired and was in now with Mark, with uh, Mitchell Ware, and uh, Frank Renard were the partners, the major partners. And we did the same kind of work with the housing authorities and some bus companies and a lot of other large firms. So we did get to that point, but we showed that uh, we needed to have large law firms with black lawyers. Now, oddly enough, when I had a 28-man firm, people would say, uh, Mr. Kennan, when are you going to go out on your own? 
I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, you got all those people you're working for. I said, no, I own the company because the concept of owning a number of lawyers is not in our community. Today, young people are getting out of law school and opening their individual offices at a time when we have uh, mergers and acquisitions and all the, all the firms and companies in the country are joining, black people are still opening individual offices. They are still saying, I want to be a judge. So what, one of, one of my, pro, one of my uh, prospects and uh, what I feel my obligation is I go around talking, and I don't do it as often now, but I used to talk to the boss of the Black Students Associations and explain to them that you don't want to just work for somebody or have an individual law firm, an individual office. You want to own your own firm. Today's lawyers say, I want to have a good job. I want to work for a large law firm. I want to work for some corporation. And the idea of being independent is a rare, a rare symbol of accomplishment. So I'm still pushing for young lawyers that you should have a, your own office, your own law firm. To go back when I was uh, out of the office, out of the army in 58, 59, while I was still in the state's attorney's office, my family is, a, is an NAACP family. So I've always, someone in the family is always dealing with the NAACP in one way or another. And we knew the history. So when I got out of the Army, there was a wonderful person named William Henry, not the politician, who was a friend of mine. And we th wanted to work with the NAACP youth. So we started an NAACP youth council. We had, it was from 12 to 18 years old. And we worked out of the West, we were still West Side. It was the West Side branch of the NAACP. In 58, 59, 60, there was a beach called Rainbow Beach, which black people didn't know about, including myself, because as far as blacks could go was at 63rd Street Beach at that time. A person, a Jewish woman, came to the NAACP office at the time that Carl Fuquay was the, uh, the executive director and said that she had been out at the beach and she saw a couple with her children out on the beach and some white people attacked them and beat them up because they said they shouldn't be there. So we were surprised because we didn't know there was a beach there. We then, uh, I would say I was in the state attorney's office, so they called me to see what we could do about that. <clears throat> we decided we were going to invade Rainbow Beach and open it up. Now, invading it the term came from down a year earlier in Biloxi, Mississippi, there was a dentist down there who took a group to invade uh, Biloxi's uh, beach. It's, it's the largest beach in the country there. It goes from Louisiana, from Mississippi, Louisiana, all that southern coast on the Gulf of uh, Mexico. At any rate, we went to the, we, um, I went to my state's attorney, my boss, at that time, I was a young Republican, and I'll explain that too. Um, and I told him that we were going to go and uh, invade the beach. We had already talked with the head uh, of the task force, the Chicago task force, police task force, and the super we talked to the assistant superintendent of police and let them know what was going to happen. So we arranged that they were going to escort us there, they were going to guard us and watch us and so forth. When I went to the state's attorney, Benjamin Adamowski, I told him, look, I'm letting you know that I'm going to be out there at the beach. I don't know what's going to happen, but you should know that I'm doing this. And this is on my own time. It was a Saturday morning. And it was just before Labor Day in 1959. So uh, he says, well, Kenan, you know, I'm a fighter myself, and I really encourage people to stand up for their own. You know, I'm a Republican in a Democratic area. I've had to fight. So all I'm asking of you is that you don't embarrass the organization. Don't embarrass our, our uh, office, and I wish you a lot of luck. Well, I was quite amazed that that was his answer. And uh, 
sure enough, we went out and we had the police with us and we had a accordion take us into the beach and there were thousands of people there. And it was the last day before uh, Labor Day. And uh, sure enough, we had a range where we would go out there and we'd all sit together. About 40 of us went. And then at a certain signal, we'd all get up together and leave. And when we came in, they were saying, niggas, go home, s -s -s -s, and all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And uh, the police with us were all white. They said, uh, we asked about black police. They said, well, we don't want to have individual little spats, and some of them might attack the individual officers, so it's best to have all whites. And they were not uniformed, those that were on the beach. The uniforms were in the perimeter out at, by the parking area. We get there and we stayed our two hours or two and a half hours or so and we give the signal and we got up to leave. It seemed that the crowd had a, their own signal. They all stood up and started coming, forging towards us and throwing rocks and things like that. And one of the young ladies was hit and hurt seriously. But we did go through the accordion and then we got out. So uh, that was the first Saturday and then uh, we, it was the end of the year. So the next year, every single Saturday, we were out there with the police. And I went to the beach more then than I've ever been, been before or since. But we stayed there for a couple of years, and we finally had died down, and we opened up Rainbow Beach, and the black community got to know the Rainbow Beach. Well, we got you through college. We got you through the state's attorney's office. We got you through a law firm. Let's go home and deal with okay. your sisters and brothers. Um, I know that your family has meetings, and I want to know who originated that and why, and what is, what is the uh, benefit of having that kind of family yes. unity and communication. We are a very, very loving family. And in fact, every Christmas, uh, we get together. The whole family gets together. Now, it started out with my father and my mother. My mother graduated from high school. My dad went to Alcorn College, but he only went two, two years, or a little less than two years maybe, but around two years. <clears throat> and uh, he has, as I said, a photogenic memory. He's an all-round man like people from Mississippi in those days were. So he's a carpenter and worked with steel and everything else. But he was also an inventor. And he invented a large machine out there where he worked that would roll steel and cut it off and do all those things. And he was a great mathematician. So when we had homework, we would go to him and he could, we'd have algebra or whatever it was, and he'd think about it, he'd tell us the answer, and that would be the answer. And he had this great vocabulary. So when we didn't know a word, we'd go ask him and he'd tell us what the word was. And it was always right. But what he said was, okay, that's the word, but you go look it up. We said, well, why would we look it up? He said, because that could be wrong. So we'd go and we'd look it up, and sure enough, he's right on the button. And after a little time, you know, we'd say, well, why would we waste time? We know you don't ever make mistakes. But one of the things he did was he did a crossword puzzle. Every night when he came in, he did the crossword puzzle, and he'd do the Tribune and all the hard ones. And he got down to seven minutes to do the crossword puzzle. And you may know there's a big society of crossword people and they have this big convention and they do, it, do the time. But he was one of those who did it on his own and that kept him sharp too. So he ran the house uh, with my mother. He was, both were very benevolent. They never demanded or anything. But they, whenever there was an issue, they would bring an issue, bring us together. Contrary to most black people, when we say that the young people, we're doing grown-ups talk now. You, you get to the side, don't you go out. And we're doing, they're doing grown-ups talk, they, you come in and listen. So when my uncles would come to the house and uh, sit, he, they, every now and then my uncle ran a shoe store and he'd, after it was closed, he'd come by the house to my dad. My dad was the oldest in that family. And they'd call all the kids up, come on in, Uncle William is here. So we'd sit around and we would have our conversations and they talk about old days and everything else with the kids sitting on the floor right there. So we were accustomed to coming when there were old people. For, for grown-ups, that was not a distinction that we were not supposed to know what grown-ups were talking about. So uh, we came up 
knowing that that was the way to do it. And there are many stories I could tell you about that today. Um, so in addition to that kind of thing, whenever there was an issue, we would sit, and in those days, you know, you lived in the kitchen. Your mother did the cooking. My mother was a non-working mother. And we all sat around the kitchen table and we talked. We'd come in from school and tell her everything that happened in school every day. So if you were the middle and I'm the middle child, I always knew what my older sister and older brother were doing. And I knew what fifth grade was when I was in fourth grade because I heard everything about it. I knew what high school was when I was in uh, elementary school. And it got so we would have meetings from time to time to just discuss what's going on. Uh, what did you do in school? What did this happen? Or particularly if there was some problem. And as we got older, we would come together from time to time. And the main thing that I learned was that you must establish traditions in a family in order to keep it together. So our family, as we got older, uh, my older brother was the first one to marry, and he would have the 4th of July. Uh, my parents would have uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and everybody would come to be there for Christmas, and it was a big, big thing. Uh, and occasionally we would have something on Labor Day, but it was an outdoor thing, it wasn't much. The 4th of July was a big one for the summer. And in our meetings, uh, as a child, of course, it was my dad and my mother. And it was nothing formal. You didn't sit down and take notes or anything, you know. But you just discussed what was going on. It was not scheduled at any particular time. It was just when things were going on. After we were grown, we would still, if there was any issue, we'd all get together and we'd discuss anything that needed to be done. Um, and the thing that we didn't do as, quite as much as my parents did for us was make sure that those children of us, our children, got together right in the midst of it. Uh, well, from time to time they did. So after my, uh, my father died first in 1966, and then my mother died in 77. But after they had passed, our family still will have the meetings. And if, if there's any problem that needs to be done, we'd call a meeting. And uh, we would settle it together. As I mentioned during the funeral, um, my oldest sister, when we were young, my mother would leave and leave her in charge of us. And we were all two years apart. So we had to do what our sister said. And if we didn't, she was exactly like mother. And she took no guff. And she'd tell mother and we'd get a whipping. So, uh, and let me just say for those who think that whippings are beatings, we never got beaten. You know, they were a strap across your back, lower back. Uh, so as we got to be older, out of respect for her, she was the person that really had the final word. And uh, she was a benevolent leader so that she would have an opinion. And we'd all have opinions. Now in my house, in our family, there's a lawyer, accountant, a minister. My sister was head of the uh, Department of Welfare. She was an administrator. She had been district office supervisor and all the way up. So all of us were accustomed to running an office. My brother was uh, uh, head of a social security office, assistant manager of the social security office, although he ran it. And uh, even though we could figure out things ourselves, we would all put it to her. And she does not say, okay, this is my opinion, I'm the leader, I get it. She would say, okay, he's the one who has the best idea, so we'll take his way. So it was always back and forth. And in coming up, for instance, uh, we never, no one ever took the last piece of anything, of food or anything else. If there was extra food there, we'd say, well, you take it or you take it. And nobody would take the last one because you always were taught to share to give to the others. It's most important that you would give to the others. So uh, we also learned from my father's rules and my mother's rules, you never take the last of anything and have any, like if there's only one piece of bread left and they need to get a new piece, a new uh, loaf of bread, you would never take that last piece. 
he let people know that that was the last piece that's there so it could be, you know, uh, replenished. So you never were out of anything. You'd have to do the uh, reporting. All right, we're down to one piece. And if there was money, we'd go to the store. In those days, you didn't have cars. You'd take your little red wagon to the store and with your mother and bring it back. And, and if we went ourselves, there was change. There was a change jar. You drop everything in the change jar. And no one ever dreamed of being a penny short. Of course, in those days, a penny was a lot. But um, you would, uh, there was a thing of honesty. My father said, you will never lock a door in my house because we never will have any distrust. So we never distrusted anyone. And it was a matter of each person giving to the other. If someone needed something, you never had to ask. We'd be saying, wait, do you need this? Or what can I do? Or can I do this for you? So it was that kind of cohesion based on a cooperative spirit that you must share with your brothers and your sisters. So it was a very sharing, loving thing. Not that we didn't have disagreements as children, as everyone does, but nobody shot anybody or cut anybody. And um, my father uh, and my mother would talk about what happened in Mississippi. So we learned about the segregated South. We learned all of the evils of the South, just as uh, a regular historian, which got all of us to be kind of junior historians. But then I became a historian myself because I got interested and went on off on my own and learned. And I joined the, um, the um, what is it, the History of American uh, Roundtable, Roundtable of oh, uh, African American round History. Oh, the Roundtable for the Study of Negro History. Right. So, you know, these were giant people who were mm -hmm. part of that. Theodore Valentine, the late Theodore Valentine. Right. As you know, and you were a part of it right. too. And we had the great speakers come in. Some of the great speakers of our time mm -hmm. came in and spoke to us. Mm -hmm. So we learned history well from original sources mm -hmm. uh, at an early age. And then I began giving lectures, history, his, history lessons and lectures. So. Uh, but it started with the seed being planted in my family to know what the family was about. And when I was in law school, we had uh, probate law. And there it's a matter of genealogy. You have to learn how, what airship is all the way down. Mm -hmm. And one of the lessons that we had to uh, complete was to do our own family genealogy. Mm -hmm. So I did my family genealogy in 1952 or so. Mm -hmm. So we began to go all the way back and we knew the history of our family. And in 75 we began having family reunions. So uh, our first one had no three, four hundred people, which was held at the Culture Center. We were the first uh, large group holding anything at the Culture Center, Southside Culture Center, uh, after it opened. And it wasn't really completely completed, but we held it there. And then we've had them, it used to have them yearly, but now every other year we get together. And it's down to 200, but uh, we know each other. And uh, the broader family isn't necessarily as close as we are. But our sibling, that immediate family, is so very close that um, we just know that we can trust each other. One of the ways was, for instance, whenever there was a problem, uh, my mother would be right there for us. And she was the one that we were around every day. But if something happened that was too bad, she'd call Dad and he'd give us the real, she'd give us a spanking. And then Dad would give us a whipping if uh, she felt it was more serious. But the thing of trust was that whenever we had a problem, we could call our dad if we were away from home. And he'd say, well, give me 10 minutes. Give me a half hour. And he was there always. There was never a time that he would, we would need him and he wouldn't be there. And of course, my mother was right there. So when you have that kind of complete self-confidence in the family, then there's a certain sense of security that you have. And I've had people say, well, how do you know he's coming? I said, what do you mean? You know, the idea that he wouldn't be there was just so weird to me that he was always there. And 
this is the way that we are with our own children and our own uh, youngsters. If ever they are called, whatever it is, family is first. Tell me about this sharing and you don't have to ask because, you know, I, I think that just ought to be self-evident. Uh, if you know, uh, and it, certainly you can, you can see or you can surmise that if someone is, say, unemployed, you know, that they were working and now they're no longer working, or their fortunes change in some way, an illness uh, befalls mm -hmm. them and they, they pick up additional uh, medical expenses or they have a child to go away to school or there are just so many things that, that impose a, 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 a family member who dies that imposes um, unusual <laughs> economic uh, stress. Why is it that we say general things like, call me if you need me, you know, if, uh, if I can do anything, just let me know, you know. Why is it that we don't do uh, more of what, what people used to do? I'm from the South. I grew up in, in Chicago, but I originated in the South and so went back there often. What state? Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I, that I knew for certain was if there was a death in the family, that there would be people coming from all over and they would always be coming bringing things to eat because they knew that you would have an unusual mm -hmm. uh, number of people visiting the house and so these people would have to eat. And if the family was grief stricken, the last thing they were thinking about was being in the kitchen cooking big meals to serve people. So the community came and they brought, you know, they brought mm -hmm. cakes and pies and big pots of this and that so that, you know, people could, could be served. Um, and very often they, they put a few dollars in the hand of the person, you know, who was the, the head of that household mm -hmm. to, to defray expenses. You know, wasn't a loan. They weren't asked. It was not expected. So this sharing, does your family, if, you, if there is a need, does your family do that? Do you just, do you, ha do you have to have a meeting about it or do you just know that that's what you're supposed to do? We don't have a meeting on that kind of situation unless it's a large situation. Mm -hmm. If someone needs two, three hundred dollars, they'll go to one of us or the other one and let us know and they get it. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, all of the members of the family are college graduates and we're all doing reasonably well. Mm -hmm. And the one thing, though, overriding is that we were taught not to be superfluous, mm -hmm. not to live beyond our means. Mm -hmm. So our family has lived less than its means. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was not concerned. My parents were not concerned with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. My dad said that, uh, for instance, no one in my family ever had a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. My dad said that it's more important to have food on the table and shelter mm -hmm. than to have a big car. Mm -hmm. And he was very upset with people who'd have the big car and who couldn't make the bills and the mm -hmm. old, owed money. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> he, was, he became the big head boss in his company. Mm -hmm. And his uh, foreman under him drove Packards and Lincolns and uh, Cadillacs mm -hmm. and all those things. And he was driving a small Hudson. Mm -hmm. So they came to him and said, you know, they called my dad Mac. Why would you be driving this Hudson? You're embarrassing us. You're the big boss, and we got bigger cars than you. Mm -hmm. He said, but my car gets me here on time every day. Mm -hmm. So even if we had thought of a Cadillac, we wouldn't even have the courage to buy a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. So we never got a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. um, you live less than, and you know today that's what the big uh, people talk about now, you know, live mm -hmm. less than you earn. Mm -hmm. And we did that. Mm -hmm. You never show off for any reason. So a part of that was in sharing. Was that you didn't burden the family. You never burdened the family or mm -hmm. yourself. You didn't go out. Now, we've had loans, and I've, without speaking out of uh, school, uh, sometimes the loans weren't paid back, mm -hmm. uh, particularly from the younger people. 
Mm-hmm. Um, well, only for the younger people. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's just let me skip ahead. Don't skip far because we got about four minutes. Okay. I do probate work. Mm-hmm. And when people die, there are so many fights for $10, $15. Mm-hmm. So we never fought for anything that we ought to get this and you ought mm-hmm. to get that. Mm-hmm. We were raised that my parents loved each of us the same, so nobody felt left out. Mm-hmm. You have fights in the black community, also the white community, mm-hmm. though, where everyone's saying, well, you, you did this to me when I was 12. You did this to me when we were 15. Mm-hmm. And they go all the way back mm-hmm. for reasons to say what you don't deserve. And I only brought sometimes people don't pay back because, you know, we forget that money. All right, mm-hmm. that's yours, and we go on from there. Mm-hmm. So that, with that positive cons- uh, uh, concentration, we don't have the kind of family problems. We were the Cosby family. People said, oh, people don't live that way. That's exactly the way we live. Mm-hmm. Cosby had the people in, and he talked. Mm-hmm. We did that. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, it made us a very loving family. We still are. My sister has just passed, and we had traditions. We have the Christmas tradition, mm-hmm. and we're going to continue that, and we'll have an empty chair. My sister's, you know, just passed, mm-hmm. and we pass out. We give gifts to everyone, but we give symbolic gifts. We mm-hmm. don't ever pay a lot of money for a gift. Mm-hmm. The gift is from your heart. Mm-hmm. So some families get bankrupt for Christmas. Mm-hmm. We never make a, a large offering. We Mm -hmm. may do it during the year or if we know we'd like to give you something, we can. Mm -hmm. But it's not something that you say, you got a bigger gift than me. Or you can't expect it. You have a right to it. You're entitled to burden everybody and bankrupt everybody because of your status in the family. That's right. So in my house, you know, I'm the lawyer and people say, well, you know, you're letting people tell you, uh, let your sister tell you what to do. I said, yes. She said, Lawrence, go sit in the corner. I go sit in the corner. I'm happy to do it because but she wouldn't give you. Uh, uh, she wouldn't make a request of you that was unreasonable. That's the trust element. That's you the can trust. you can cooperate. You can surrender because you trust that the other person will not exploit you exactly. and take advantage of you. So all of that has exactly. to be part of the love, the trust, the consistency. They say you know you shouldn't have can't have competition. We had competition. We loved it because we knew it was to make us better. My dad said being correct is what's impossible, is mm-hmm. what's correct. Mm-hmm. So we would have this competition. And then if someone won a prize or something, that was us winning the prize. Mm-hmm. So we were so happy for my brother to win something or my sister to win something because we won. Mm-hmm. And my uncle, John, uh, uncle William, we would come in and we, he, they would show our report cards mm-hmm. to my uncles Mm -hmm. and they said oh you can't get a C you're a Mm Kenan so we were taught oh you're a Kenan you can't do this so many Mm -hmm. of the things that other people would do we said we can't do that Mm -hmm. and my guys outside when they wanted to go ski well you know we could talk and we do and we will and I'm glad that you came so we could have this chat because okay. it was, you told me a lot of things I didn't know. I've talked to you so long, I thought I knew everything. Oh, it's a deep family. Thank you, Attorney Lawrence E. Kennan. It's all very simple, though. The simpler the better.